so I guess I'll just start by saying thank you all for coming back. It's good to see I didn't scare everyone away with the Zane's talk. Hopefully the XAFs won't scare people away, but it's good to see you all again. Uh, just as a little bit of a reminder of where we are in the schedule, we've already gotten done with day one, so we're a good chunk of the way into things. We're going to start out today very much like we did last Thursday. We'll have a, a couple of slides on XFs, then we'll have a little bit of a break, and then we'll do a hands-on tutorial that Luis will lead you through. And then <clears throat> that'll close out today. Then tomorrow, we'll start back here at 9 in the morning, so a little bit of an earlier day, and I'll talk about some experimental uh, information. And then the rest of the day will basically be open-ended for you guys to check in with us and ask any questions that you have or have us help you with any data that you might want to work on. And that will close things out. So just showing this slide that should look a little bit familiar from last week uh, to reiterate that Luis and I are here. Our goal here is to really answer any questions that you have about XFs. And so similar to the way that we did it last time, if you have any questions going through this talk, you can type them in the chat to Luis, either type your question or just say that you have a question. And then when she thinks it's a convenient time, she'll either, she'll stop me and she'll either ask your question or she'll unmute you so that you can ask it. So don't be shy. We have lots of time built in here for questions. So, you know, yeah, definitely ask anything that you have. This talk today is a little bit shorter than last time. So we have even more time for questions. So don't be shy. Okay, so we're gonna dive right into things. This is another slide that hopefully looks familiar to kind of refresh what we're doing in an XAS, a Zanes or an XAS experiment. So here we have uh, your standard kind of energy level diagram. And in an XAS experiment, it starts out the exact same way as Zanes, where you're exciting core electrons with high energy X-ray photons. And when you excite those core electrons, you send them into unoccupied orbitals or you totally ionize the atom. That gives rise to spectra that look like this, where you have the pre-edge and the edge that we talked about last week. And then above the edge to even higher incident energies, we have the XFs. And so we'll zoom in here. And now it might be a little bit counterintuitive that we would have any information up here above the edge, because all we're doing is we're ionizing an atom. And so you wouldn't really expect there to be any unoccupied orbitals or conduction band or anything interesting that you could be exciting an electron into. This is just ionization. And yet we do see these nice intense wiggles that do contain information. So the first question is really, where do these XFs come from? And that's a little bit of an abstract concept. But what we're doing is when you ionize an electron from an atom, that electron leaves the atom and you can think of it as a wave, like a photoelectron wave. And that wave propagates out from that absorbing atom off into space around it. And now if you had a free atom, you know, like a noble gas atom, for example, that has nothing close to it, that photoelectron wave would propagate out forever, it wouldn't do anything interesting, and you would see a flat line through the excess. There'd be no information out here whatsoever. In condensed matter, so compounds and elements and those kinds of things, you don't just have a single absorbing atom, you have other atoms that are nearby. And so in those cases, that photoelectron that you've excited off the absorbing atom can bounce off the electrons of those nearby atoms and it can come back to the absorbing atom. And that's what's depicted, depicted by these red uh, wave fronts there. And when it comes back, it can, con uh, it can interfere with the outgoing wave either constructively or destructively. And when there's constructive interference, what you get are these uh, kind of maxima in your XFs. And when it interferes destructively, you get these minima. And now I realize this is kind of a, an abstract way of thinking about it. And so if things don't make complete sense now, don't worry. We'll talk about this in a lot more depth coming up. But this is kind of a, a cartoon picture of what's going on. You have a wave propagating out, interfering with nearby atoms, and coming back. And that contains information about the nearby atoms. Specifically, from XF, you can learn about the distance of the atoms that are close to the absorber you can learn how many uh, scattering partners there are, and you can learn about their identities. And so these are really the three big questions that you want to answer when you're doing an XAPS experiment. So <clears throat> to make this in kind of a different kind of a cartoon uh, form, here we again have the absorbing atom, and you can think of it basically as the 
outgoing electron can bounce off a nearby atom, this green guy, and then come back. So that's what each of these red arrows. The, this one is going out, interfering, and coming back. And so if it's this kind of a, a setup, we call that single scattering. Single meaning that there's only one other atom that this is scattering off before it comes back. This is you know, relatively simple. Single scattering tends to dominate XFs. So just the absorber and one other partner, that's where most of the intensity usually comes from. But of course, you can have things that are, that are a little bit more complex. So you can have the outgoing wave interfere with one, keep going interfere with the second one before it comes back, or, and you can put those in any kind of a different arrangement. And we call that multiple scattering, where you end up inter interacting with multiple atoms before you come back. And when you do the, the tutorial this afternoon, you'll actually be calculating both some single and some multiple scattering. So hopefully this will make a little bit more sense once you see it there. Now, a question that I often get is, how does excess differ from crystallography? Because on the face of it, they both give you very similar information. They're both giving you structural information about you know, a sample that you're measuring. And so here I wanted to highlight some of the differences you know, some of the benefits and drawbacks of each method. So with XFs, the, the main benefit is that you can apply this really to pretty much any element in any sample environment down to relatively low concentrations. And so this could be a solid, this could be a solution, this could be an electrode, this could be any number of things. You can do XFs on essentially everything. You also get relatively good precision on the bond lengths. Um, it's, typically quoted to be precise to about 0 0.02 angstroms. So that's you know, quite good uh, determination of what the, the absorber scatter distances are. Um, unfortunately for XFs, you typically can't distinguish between similar atoms. So things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen all look very similar. <clears throat> There's also a pretty big uncertainty in the number of scatterers. And we'll talk about this in depth later on. But it typically, the number is, has an error of plus or minus 25%. So that means if something is five or six or four coordinate, you won't generally be able to tell that from XFs. And kind of the big difference from crystallography is that you don't get any mid to long range distance info. Um, the information of XFs is typically limited to about four or five angstroms from that absorbing atom. Everything else is too far away to see anything. <clears throat> crystallography, on the other hand, will give you the complete 3D structure of whatever you're measuring. And so you get a lot more distance information than you do with XFs. Unfortunately, for crystallography, you need crystals. And for most of the things that you guys work with, particularly anything that's actively undergoing a reaction, that simply doesn't happen. And so this is the one big drawback of crystallography is it has a very defined sample it can take. And it can't get data on many interesting systems. And that's really where XFs comes in as a complementary technique. Okay. So now I'm going to show you some math here. And if you're anything like me, like math is kind of scary to see this early in the talk. And this is kind of a frightening equation. And so we're, we're going to go through this piece by piece. Hopefully it will make sense as we do it. Don't let this scare you away too much now. So <clears throat> we'll break this down in parts. So um, this is the equation that uh, governs the, uh, how XFs look like. And so this N out in front here is the number of scatterers. So that's one of the things we said we could learn from XFs, the number, and that's why it's in this equation. We also said the distance, which shows up in a couple places. That's also information we can get. And then there's this sigma squared factor, which we call the Debye-Waller factor, and that's a measure of uncertainty. And don't worry if this is a lot of information all at once. We're going to go through each of these one by one in later slides. So <clears throat> just remember that these are the kinds of things that are in the equation, and we'll see this equation more than once. Uh, then you have this f of k and delta of k. These are scattering phases and amplitudes that we can calculate using FEF. And we'll do this during the tutorial. So you'll, you'll see how these work. And then there's a passive electron reduction factor, which we'll talk about later. But the take-home message from this slide is that when we fit XFs, the, the number, the distance, and the Debye-Waller factor are the parameters that we change during fitting. So these are the information that we really get out of fitting. Uh, and we calculate the scattering and the amplitude using FEF, and that's where the identity of the scatterer comes from. So these blocks really contain the information content of XFs. So we'll do this a little bit differently than we did the Zanes. 
the things we talked about, kind of the information you could get, and then talked about data. For excess, we're going to do it the opposite way. We're going to start by talking about how you get and how you process data, and then how you get information out of that. And the reason for that is because the excess data is a little bit perhaps less intuitive to see than the Zane's data. There's a lot of processing that goes into it. So we'll cover how you get things that look like XFs first, and then how you use those XFs to get information. So we start with a spectrum that looks very much like we started with Zane's. So you have your pre-edge background, an edge jump, and then to higher energy, you have your XFs. Very much like Zane's, we begin by subtracting the pre-edge background. So here we have a pretty uh, uh, steep slope. So you'll, you'll fit that to some function, and you'll subtract that off the data. This has very little impact on the XFs because it's so far away, but it helps, to, it helps for normalizing the spectrum. So once we have that, we'll go through and we'll do a normalization and a background subtraction, exactly like we did for Zane's. I don't have an animation for those, but just trust me. So once we've done that, we can zoom in here on the XFs. And here we're, we're looking at XFs, even though they don't look anything like XFs that you would see published. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of processing that goes into these XFs to get them in a form that you would recognize. The first is that you'll notice that this is still sitting on kind of a, a background. And that's even after background subtraction. And the reason for that is because when you ionize an atom, that photoelectron wave propagates away. And it can scatter off the electrons of nearby atoms, which give you XFs but it can also scatter off the other electrons of the absorbing atom. And so that will also give you oscillations in the XFs that don't contain any information that we really want. They just get in the way of analysis of the XFs. So we want to get rid of those uh, kind of like self-interaction uh, type scattering. Fortunately, when an uh, atom is scattering off its own electrons, those tend to be very long wavelength XFs. So we can subtract them effectively with a low order polynomial, something like a, a cubic or a quadratic polynomial. And you'll do this during your tour. Well, basically, you'll fit that background to a function. It will look something like this dotted blue line. You see it kind of goes through the middle of the XFs and helps to take that background away. We call this a spline. This is spline removal. So when you remove the spline, you then get this. So now it's nice, it's nice and flat. You don't have that background anymore. It's centered on zero. But still, this doesn't look anything like published XFs. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because it's still on an axis of energy. And if you've ever seen a published XFs plot, the x-axis uh, is never in energy. It's always in something called k. And you don't need to worry about what k is. All you need to know is that you calculate k by taking the current energy you're at minus the energy of the edge. And then there's a whole bunch of constants in the square root two that simplify down to you know, the square root of 0 0.25, 2625 times that difference in energy. So what this serves to do is because it's a square root function, it takes the XFs at low energy and it makes them broader, it stretches them out. And it takes the XFs at high energy and it squishes them together. And that's just because this is a square root and the that's how the difference operates. So we can convert the energy into K and that gives you the plot that you're seeing here, which again, you can see that stretching, this gets much more broad. And then out here at higher k, they get squished together. But still, this doesn't really look like XFs you're used to seeing. And the reason for that is because you'll notice that the XFs down here at high k are very low intensity. And that's a general feature of XFs. The higher in energy, the higher in k you go, the lower the intensity is. It drops off as about one over E. So at high energy, high K, you have very low amplitude. And it's hard to see exactly what's going on down here in the XFs. So what people will do is they will multiply the XF signal by K. Sometimes they even do K squared or K cubed. So what that means is that here at two, at K of two, you would multiply the XF signal by you know, two cubed, eight. Out here at 10, you multiply the XF signal by 10 cubed or 1,000. So what that really serves to do is it enhances the high k xfs and kind of depresses the low k xfs. And so it would give you something that looks like the plot over here on the right, which hopefully looks a lot more similar to xfs that you're used to seeing published. These things at low k get squished, and these things at high k get blown up. You'll notice that this also tends to amplify the noise at very high k, 
And that's something that you'll see in the tutorial as well. This tends to be what limits the quality of the XFs you can collect is the noise at high K because you're multiplying it by such big factors when you get out there. So just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't know if, if you look at a plot like this and can see any intuitive information out of that. I know I look at that and I just see a squiggly line. So it's, it's hard to intuitively really get anything out of just looking at an XFs plot. So what people will often do is they'll take the Fourier transform of the XFs. <clears throat> And what that does is that gives you a plot like this over here on the right. And that converts the k-axis into a distance axis. And in the Fourier transform, the intensity is proportional to the amount of scattering. So what you can use these Fourier transforms for is you can look at the x-axis and you say, OK, at about two angstroms, there's a lot of scattering happening. So what that tells us is that at two angstroms from the absorbing atom, there's a lot of ligands or something out there. We can also look up here at longer distance, you know, 3.75 or so, and see that, okay, there's a little bit of intensity down there. So there might be, you know, something that's either really far away or something that's kind of disordered at that distance. So just looking at a Fourier transform, you can get a rough idea of where the major uh, atoms are nearby the absorber. And so this is a much more intuitive way of looking at the data. And you may have seen plots and papers that look like this where they take the Fourier transforms and they assign the different, you know, peaks in intensity to different scattering interactions. And so, you know, the Fourier transforms are really a lot nicer way of looking at the data, even though the, the XFs themselves, these wiggles are really where all of this is coming from. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at data. These are not XFs, these are the XFs. <laughs> okay, so now, the really important question here is, how do we get information out of all these wiggles? And similar to Zane's, we get information out by fitting them. Um, a little bit, we fit them in a different way than we fit Zane's though. So with Zane's, you would take a spectrum and you would add peaks to that spectrum to add up to get the spectra, and that's how you would do it. For XFs, we're not going to add peaks to them because it's just a sine wave. So what we do in order to fit XFs is we will calculate theoretical XFs for an interaction that we think we have in the system. So here, I can't see my mouse, there's my mouse. If we think that there's a cobalt oxygen interaction, we'll give that to the computer program, FEF in this case, and we'll calculate what the theoretical XFs look like between those two. And you would get a plot over here that looks like the right. Um, the way that the computer codes do that is they they take two pieces of information. The first is the scattering amplitude, which is this arrow shown in red. It's, you can think of it as the intensity of those XFs wiggles. The intensity is dependent both on the identity of that scattering atom and also on K. So you can see that the intensity changes as you come along the x-axis here, and that's from the phase. That will depend on the identity of the atom. The other thing that these codes use is the uh, phase of the scattering. And you can think of that as being related to the wavelength and also the position of this wave along the x-axis. These phases are also dependent on the identity of the scattering atom and also on k. So the wavelength will subtly change as k changes. Now, to represent this in kind of a more uh, pictorial way, here we've calculated theoretical excess for oxygen, sulfur, and iron. And here you can see the what difference those phases and amplitudes have. So for oxygen, you'll see that the amplitude is relatively constant across the entire K range, whereas for sulfur, it starts out low, peaks, and then starts dropping off. Whereas for iron, it starts very low, peaks, and then drops off slower. And so that's, this is one of the places where the identity of the scatterer can be extracted from excess, because the amplitudes of different scattering partners are very different. The phases are also slightly different. It's harder to see in this plot, but you'll just have to take my word for it that the phases also vary with atomic number. So over here on the left are the calculated XFs, and over here on the right, we can see the Fourier transforms of those different uh, XFs. So what you see down here is <clears throat> oxygen gives you the lowest amplitude, sulfur gives you more, iron gives you even more. And so this is a very general feature of XFs. The heavier the scattering partner is, 
the more intense the XFs will be. And so what this means is that it's a lot easier to see heavy atoms like other metals or like chlorine, bromine, sulfur, heavy atoms in XFs than it is to see light atoms. This is particularly true at longer distances, which we'll see in a couple of slides. So, okay. So we're gonna come back to the XFs equation here and hopefully things look a little more familiar. So the way that we can actually use those calculated XFs to get information is we calculate this F of K and this delta of K. Those are the phase and amplitude. So those are plugged into the equation. And then what we do is we'll use the coordination number, the distance, and the sigma squared to modify what those scattering paths look like. So it'll modify the phase, modify the amplitude, and we'll uh, change the and R and sigma squared to try to get the calculated XFs to match the experiment. And so that will tell us what the coordination number, the distance, and sigma squared is. So here's an example. So let's say that we have a system where there's a cobalt atom, it's got some sulfur ligands, it has an oxygen, and then over here on the other side, it has an iron. What we would do is we would calculate a theoretical XFs for each of these interactions. So you'd calculate cobalt oxygen, cobalt sulfur, and cobalt iron scattering. That would give us paths that look like this. And then for each of these pads, we would change the number, the distance, and the sigma squared until the sum of those pads added up to our experimental data. So that's what you'll be doing in the tutorial with Luis this afternoon. You'll be calculating some pads, and then you'll be changing the coordination number, the distance, and sigma squared to try to match the data. So for the next couple of slides, what we'll, go, what we'll do is we'll go through and we'll look at the effect that each of these different um, parameters has on the calculated XFs. So we'll start with the coordination number. So, so this is the, <clears throat> the number of scatterers we have. What you can see is um, over here on the left, we start with one oxygen. In red, we have two. And in blue, we go up to four. And so what we can see is that as you get more and more, um, as the coordination number gets higher, the amplitude of those XFs goes up and up and up. Similarly, with the Fourier transform, the intensity linearly increases with coordination number. So what this means is that it's a lot easier to see multiple, or it's a lot easier to see uh, interactions when you have more partners than it is when you only have one. So, okay. So then we'll move along to distance. So here we have a set where we have an oxygen atom that's scattering. We start out at 1.7 angstroms. We then change to 2.2 and 2.7. And so you can see a couple of things happen here. The first and most obvious is that the amplitude goes down as the distance increases. So it's, it's harder to see things that are farther away because the amplitude is smaller. The other thing you can see is that the, the frequency of these waves increases as the distance goes up. So this wavelength is pretty long up here at 1.7, and it's a lot shorter at 2.7. And these are reflected in the Fourier transforms by, you can see that, um, at short distance, you show up at shorter distance on the r-axis, so that's exactly what you would hope to see, and you also uh, see the intensity drop off as you get farther away. And this is again a consequence of the intensity of the scattering drops off as one over the distance. So things that are far away become a lot harder to see. You know, already down here at um, 2.7 angstroms, you're getting pretty low in intensity. So it's, it's actually fairly uncommon to, to see light atoms too much beyond about three angstroms. It's easier to see other metals or things like heavy halides out between three and four and five angstroms, but light atoms are hard to see. So, okay. So the last of those parameters that we can change is the Debye-Waller factor. Uh, the Debye-Waller factor is a measure of the disorder in the system. So um, the, the value of this parameter is pretty much always between 0 0.01 and 0 0.001, with smaller numbers being more rigid, more ordered systems, and bigger numbers being more disordered, more, you know, you can think of the bond as being more floppy as your uh, Debye-Waller factor goes up. So what you can see is down here at 0.001, for a nice rigid, stiff bond, you have, uh, whoops, skipping ahead, <laughs> you have uh, fairly intense XFs. It doesn't really modulate the, the amplitude very much. When you go up to 0.005, 
what you see is the overall amplitude goes down, and you also start losing a lot of intensity out at high k. By the time you get to 0.01, again, the overall amplitude is down, and you've lost almost all of your intensity out at high k. That's reflected in the Fourier transforms by a reduction in the intensity. And this is <clears throat> the, the larger Debye Waller factors are things that you often see for kind of disordered systems. And you also see it more at higher temperature because things move around a lot more at higher temperature. And so things become more disordered and the XF's intensity goes down. Okay, so I'd like to pause here and just, does anyone have any questions so far about anything that we've talked about? I don't see any questions in the chat so far. Okay. Oh, someone has a question. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Jocelyn. Thank you, Liz. Hey, Chris. So looking at the Fourier transform of the XFs. Yes. Uh, so you're focusing on the most intense points. I can see that. But how do you know that those other small waves, if you will, at the like below 0.5 are mm -hmm. actual signals or not? So how, how can you discriminate from that? The, that's a really good question. And the answer is by, really the only way you can is by fitting. Because like, since this is a Fourier transform, everything kind of has these wiggles to it. And the only way that you can know that something is simply a component of one interaction and not a totally different path is to fit it because the fitting will be able to know where these other little wiggles should be. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess it will get very complicated if you have mixtures of uh, crystals or, or mix, mixtures of different substances in your sample, right? Yes, if, if you have mixtures of substances, XFs can become very challenging to find a unique fit for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions, Luis? Um, I don't see any other questions. Okay. Okay, so at this point, we've talked about the three parameters that we will change when we fit XFs, the coordination number, the distance, and the Bywaller factor. But there are still some other uh, terms in the XFs equation that we haven't talked about yet. So the first one is this S naught squared parameter. This is what they call the passive electron reduction factor, which is a whole lot of words to basically say that in the old days, back when they were first beginning to calculate XFs, using theory, the theory would always overestimate the intensity of the XFs. This was due to some shortcomings in the theory. It didn't take some things into account that it needed to. And so this uh, S squared parameter was introduced to scale down the calculated XFs to better match experiment. So historically, the value is used somewhere between 0.7 and 1. And like I was saying, this is to reduce the calculated amplitude so that they better match the experiment. When we're fitting data, this parameter is something that we will fix at the beginning and we won't change it. So it's a, it's a parameter that we can choose, but it doesn't get fit when we fit XFs. It just stays the same. And what you'll notice is that S squared and N are basically multiplied together in this equation. And so what that means is that these two are completely correlated. So if you increase S squared, it will decrease N. And if you increase n, it will decrease s squared. This is one of the reasons why the coordination number has such high uncertainty, because these things are multiplied together, and there's no way of knowing precisely uh, whether n should be increased or s, or s squared should be increased. So that's one of the origins of that bigger uncertainty. The last parameter in the equation that doesn't actually show up in the equation, but will when we're fitting, is an e, e naught, or delta e naught. And what this is, is this is basically a parameter that says where in energy space do the XFs begin? It's typically a couple of EV above the edge, and the precise value doesn't really have any physical meaning. It's important just to know that it doesn't get, you know, usually outside the range of plus or minus 10 EV, definitely outside the range of plus or minus 20. If it does, that tells you something is going wrong with your fit, because it should definitely be within this range. The other thing I wanted to tell you is when you're fitting XFs, you'll have a couple of different paths. Each one of those will have a delta E naught value. Those delta E naughts should be the same for every single path. I've seen papers published where people try not to do this, and that, that makes the XFs analysis meaningless. 
and you're going to go through a lot of work to get the next half spent. So you don't want this to be the thing that messes you up. So just make sure for every path, the delta E naught is the same. And then you'll be a lot happier camper when your analysis actually means something. Okay. So for those of you who are paying very close attention to these Fourier transforms, what you might have noticed is that the distance that we have a scatter, so these are all at 2.5, doesn't exactly correlate with where they show up in the Fourier transform. Here, this, this oxygen, we know it's a 2.5 because I put it there, but it's showing up, the peak in the Fourier transform is just above two. Uh, the sulfur is a little bit above the oxygen and the iron is just a little bit above the sulfur, but none of them are even close to 2.5. And the reason for this is because there's a phase shift. That's what this delta is. And so you don't have to concern yourself with the math behind this, but just know that when you look at a Fourier transform, the apparent position where things show up is always going to be shorter than the actual distance. For light atoms, that difference is about 0.5 angstroms. So if you read a peak off the Fourier transform at two angstroms, you know that it's, the scatter is actually at 2.5 for light atoms that difference goes down a little bit for heavier atoms. So for something like iron, it's probably at uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that. So that's why you can see as, as these get heavier, the peak moves closer to the actual value, but it never quite gets there because there's always this shift. So when you're looking at XS data, you can mentally do this and you know, add a little bit to where you see the peak, but this is taken care of automatically when we fit. So fitting will know what the phase shift is, and it will correct this for us. So this is one of the many reasons why fitting is really the way to go with XFs, because it knows precisely what the phase shift should be and will give us the actual distance when it isn't affected by this phase shift at all. OK, so then I just have one more slide here on uncertainty that we touched on a little bit before. And so we have the S squared and, and the divide waller factor all multiplied in the numerator of this equation. And basically what that has the effect of doing is it increases the uncertainty for all of those parameters because you can compensate for one by changing the other. So that's what gives the high uncertainty in the coordination number. The atomic number uncertainty, so the identity of the scattering atom, that comes about because the phases and the amplitudes that we calculate are different for each and every atom, but they don't change that quickly. So oxygen looks an awful lot like nitrogen, which looks an awful lot like carbon. They're only subtly different. They're not really different enough to tell. So we typically say that the identity, you can't really tell within plus or minus one. So nitrogen, so something that you fit as a nitrogen could also be a carbon, could also be an oxygen. It could not be a sulfur or it could not be an iron because those are different enough to tell. But within a couple, you know, atomic number of plus or minus one or two, that could easily be that's easily within the uncertainty. Then the distance, the distance shows up in uh, a couple places that are different from each other. And so there the uncertainty is actually quite good. It's about 0.01 or 0.02 angstroms. So this is really where XF shines. It gives you very precise distances and can fit these other things with some bigger error bars on them. So, okay. Now that we, actually, now that we've talked about the theory a lot, does anyone have any questions at this point? I don't see any questions yet. I'll give it about 15 seconds so people can type. <laughs> OK, so we'll move on to experiment. Uh, OK, I didn't give it enough 15 seconds. <laughs> you can go ahead. I can go ahead. Hi, Chris. Hi, yes. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Chris and Luis. Uh, I'm sorry, I joined a little bit late. I missed a couple of slides. Uh, I, I have a layman question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when we will get the coordination number information, will that give us the information to tell the oxidation states of the compound or what information it gives? Ah, that's an excellent question. So Nowhere throughout any of this have I ever talked about oxidation state of an absorbing atom. And that's because to XFs, XFs has no idea about oxidation state at all. The only place that 
you could infer an oxidation state would come from the distance. And that's because as, as your metal becomes higher oxidation state, the bond distances tend to get shorter and shorter. So that's the only place that oxidation state would show up. Otherwise, there's no way to get that from XFs, which is also why XFs is often paired with Zanes, because Zanes can very well give you the, um, the oxidation state. And XFs has no idea about it. <laughs> OK, thanks. Can yeah. I ask one more question, if nobody is asking? <laughs> Okay, can I ask one more question? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a practical uh, question. I work uh, on thin films. Uh, often thin film substrates have oxygen. Mm -hmm. So as you explained, the lesser the atomic number, they have a weaker, I think smaller scattering factor. So, so how we will able to Sure, I to tell that with some, uh, I mean, uh, make sure that there is no ambiguity that this oxygen information you get from thin film or you get from the substrate. Okay, so the... Let's say, for, for example, I have a strontium titanate substrate. Mm -hmm. I grow like barium oxide. Mm -hmm. Okay, barium strontium oxide or whatever. So when I study for the oxygen, I have oxygen in the thin film and I have oxygen on the substrate. Mm -hmm. So how I will be sure that the oxygen information I am getting is only coming from the thin film, not from the substrate. Yeah, okay. So the way that you would do that is you would do a barium XFs experiment. So only the barium would be absorbing and only the barium would be scattering off oxygens nearby. So because XFs can only see within about four or five angstroms of an absorber, the only thing that that would see is oxygen close to your thin film and not in the substrate because the strontium, the titanium won't be absorbing at those energies. It will just be the barium. Okay, so great. I think what is the penetration depth of the uh, XF lines? <laughs> so <laughs> penetration depth is something that we'll talk about tomorrow with the experiment okay. section, because that changes very strongly based on energy. <laughs> okay, that's right. So that's, that's a preview of coming attractions for tomorrow. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, no problem. Are there any other questions? There's no more questions. No more questions. Okay. So we'll uh, change gears a little bit and look at some experiment. So, like I was just talking about in some of the questions, XFs is very often paired with Zanes because they can give you uh, orthogonal information. So each one can tell you something unique that the other one can't. So in this example here, it was kind of a cool example where they had a stationary uh, catalyst bed in a capillary and they were flowing gases over that. This is similar to what would happen in like the catalytic converter of a car. You'd come in with uh, nitrogen oxide and some ammonia. You'd pass that over the catalyst. And at the other end, you would end up with just nitrogen and H2O. And they wanted to know how this catalyst was changing as the reaction was taking place. And so this was a really neat experiment design because <clears throat> what they could do is they could probe different distances along the capillary. And because the reactants go in one side and the products out the other, distance along the capillary correlated with reaction time. So they could look at different reaction intermediates based on where they were probing along this capillary with the x-rays. And so what they could see is they could see a change in oxidation state based on uh, how the reaction was progressing. And they also saw changes in the coordination environment as the reaction was progressing. And so they got the oxidation state from the zanes and they got the coordination environment from the excess. And they could use this to build a picture of actually what the intermediates looked like in this cycle and eventually what the entire catalytic cycle looked like to do this reaction. So it was a really neat uh, kind of a combined study. You can also do fancy things like in situ electrochemistry. So here they had a species deposited on an electrode. They changed the potential. And again, Zanes was combined with XFs. In Zanes, they could see a change in the oxidation state. And in XFs, they saw a change both in the atoms directly bonded to the absorber here in this first peak, and also some longer range things happening as well, based on what the potential was. 
So again, Zanes and XFs are you know, very often paired together and they provide unique information that can complement the analysis. So if you're planning an experiment, I would definitely recommend you think about doing both Zanes and XFs. You also get uh, Zanes basically for free when you do XFs because you have to go through the edge to get to the XFs anyway. So if you have the data, you might as well use it. Okay, so when we're planning about an experiment, there are a couple of questions that you guys should be thinking about uh, when you're trying to design these. The first is, what resolution of the XFs do you need? And what I mean, we'll talk about resolution on the next slide, but what I mean by this is, what do you think the two closest things are that you have to differentiate? If the only thing you really want to know is what is the average first shell distance, then you don't need very high resolution. You just need to be able to you know, resolve the first shell from the second, which is like one angstrom resolution. And so XS will definitely give you that. If on the other hand, you're trying to differentiate between maybe two different ligands in the first coordination sphere, <clears throat> those will be much closer together. So you'll need much higher resolution XFs in order to do that. Another thing to consider is, is your sample changing with time or is it damaging quickly? Because both of those will limit how long you can do an XF scan and the time will limit how high in energy or how high in K you can scan, which will influence your resolution. So if you have something that's changing very quickly, don't try to plan to do a very long energy scan because your sample will be changed by the time you get to the end of it. Um, other question is how dilute is your sample? XFs, like I was saying, they, they, the intensity dies out as one over the energy. So as you get to high energy, your intensity tends to be very low. If you also have a dilute sample, when you get out to high energy, you're going to have very little XF signal. So if you want to be able to have data out that far, you need to be able to plan for taking very long scans, taking very many scans in order to get the noise down out in that high K region. Because otherwise, if your sample is dilute, you simply, it'll, it'll look like noise. It won't even look like XFs. Kind of, um, the nice thing about XFs is that the resolution of the incident beam doesn't really matter for these experiments. The wiggles and XFs that you saw a couple of slides ago, those were many dozens of EV wide. And so whether your incident resolution beam is 0.5 EV or 5 EV doesn't really influence the shape of an XFs wiggle that's 50 EV wide. So you can get away with much worse resolution than you can in the Zanes measurement, which is kind of nice. <clears throat> okay, so the last thing we'll talk about here is what do I mean by resolution? Uh, resolution is something we can calculate based on this equation here. <clears throat> Basically, it's the resolution is equal to pi divided by two times the K range that you're Fourier transforming. And so what that means is as you accumulate data to higher K, your resolution will go up. And by resolution, what I'm talking about here is the smallest distance between which, you can uh, between which you can see two different scatterers. And we'll see a picture of that very soon. So here's a table of some examples. So if you scan 300 EV above the edge, that the maximum delta K you can have is 8.7 based on the equation we saw many slides ago now. That gives you a distance resolution of 0.18 angstroms. So this is not a very good resolution. <clears throat> if you instead go 700 EV above the edge, your delta K is now 13.3, and your resolution has increased to 0.12 angstroms. So this is quite a bit better. As you go higher and higher, the resolution increases, but you'll see you reach kind of an asymptote. You know, you can increase by 200 EV your scan, your delta K increases, but the resolution doesn't. And so there's definitely a point of diminishing returns. Most people tend not to go more than about 1,000 EV above the edge because there simply isn't an improvement in resolution out there, and the excess are so low in intensity that these experiments are painful to do. So here I'll show you examples of what these different XFs look like. So up here, of <clears throat> a delta K is only six. I should tell you what I'm doing. So in, the, in this example, I have one oxygen at 1.9 angstroms, one at 2.1, and another one a lot farther away at 3.0. So here at uh, delta K is six, you see, a really kind of broad blob in the Fourier transform at short distance. And you maybe have a hint of something up here for the second or for the, the long oxygen, but it's really hard to tell. 
when you go to delta k of eight, the first shell peak sharpens up quite a lot, and <clears throat> so does the oxygen at three angstrom. So this is a lot easier to be able to see what's going on. You know, eight is about the the minimum that I would recommend ever doing an XFS experiment, because from these data you can tell with pretty good precision what the first shell is at, and you can also see things a little bit farther away. As you increase that delta k, you'll see things continue to get sharper and sharper. And eventually, down here at the time you get to delta k of 16, everything looks very sharp. And you again see these kind of like shoulders that might look like real interactions that we were talking about with one of the questions a while ago. But those are actually just components of these three things that happen to show up at different distances. So again, another reason why fitting is good, especially at high resolution, to make sure that you know what is actually a real path and what isn't. Okay, so we're gonna get wrapping up here. Basically, <clears throat> just uh, to recapitulate some things that we went over, XS is element selective. You can apply it to almost every element and sample environment is very flexible, unlike things like crystallography. You can very precisely get metal ligand bond distances and also with somewhat lower precision, the identity and the number of ligands. Higher K means higher resolution. And in order to get anything useful out of this, you really have to fit the data. So this kind of hopefully summarizes most of what we talked about. I'll again leave you with this slide that has a bunch of references or other resources for planning experiments. And I will end here after only 45 minutes if anyone has any questions. I don't see any questions yet. Give it time. Questions are like a fine wine. They take time to come. <laughs> OK, so if no one is asking, then I'll ask. Um, so my question is, when people talk about the Fourier transform of the XFs, mm -hmm. and they relate the distances to, well, the nearest neighbor, can, is that directly related to like the bond length in, in a substance in a crystal or? Yes, yes it is. Okay, so if, that's why we do the fifth calculations, I'm guessing, right? Because of yes, the Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so in theory, you could not even fit, but you could look at where your point is, right? In the distance and then correlate mm -hmm. it to the structure if you know how far away they're in the structure, right? Yeah, so if, if you happen to have a crystal structure, that can be a good way to check to make sure that the XFs and the crystal are measuring the same thing, because the distance in the XFs, after you account for that phase shift, should show up at exactly the same as in the crystal structure. Okay, but there's a sensor of uncertainty, right, in the, in the distance, and you said in your presentation it's about point, uh, point 0.01 or point 0.02? Yes. In, in the, okay, so it's, it's very, very close. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then we have one more question from Palai. You can hey, talk. hi, Chris. Hi there. <laughs> what is the minimum dopant we can have in the compound that can be detected with the x uh, Yeah, so that's a good So that depends a little bit on what the element is. Um, heavier elements, we tend to be able to detect better than uh, lighter elements. So something like platinum is easier than titanium. But we can definitely do excess down to a few ppm or a few millimolar, depending on what your concentration preference is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I don't see any more questions. Okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I guess we can take a little bit of a break and then come back for the hands-on. Does that sound like a good plan, Luis?